I am thankful for the journey that God has placed me on. It's quite the ride. Sometimes I feel like I'm hanging on for dear life. <laughs> but it has been a blessing. And ever since my very first concert right here in this church, Pastor Larry Lichten Walter, I remember after that event, when the concert had closed, he asked the elders of the church to come forward, and, and they surrounded me, and we, we had a prayer right here. And he said, God, dedic dedicate this ministry. Bless this ministry. It is dedicated to you, he said. And make it touch people far and wide. And he had no idea that prayer of dedication, what it would lead to. Literally millions of miles and tens of thousands of people that we've been able to come in contact with and bless just through the, the message and music. And it all started here. So this is a very special day for me, a very special day for my family. And I'm thankful for all of you who along the way, familiar faces that I'm seeing, who have been mentors through the process. You're a gift in my life. You're the pillars in my heart, and I'm thankful for you. A lot of you know that I sing for It Is Written. It Is Written has been uh, its own incredible journey. The last 11 years I've been singing for them as their affiliate musician. I get to follow Pastor John around like a lost puppy and sing for him when he has events in the United States. So I try to keep it in the U.S. as much as possible. I have two little girls that I would never see if, we, uh, if I decided to leave the country. But my wife and girls and I, we pretty much travel full time in a tour bus and uh, go around the country singing for different events, like it is written in evangelistic series. And I get to take them with me because of that bus. It's a blessing. So when I go somewhere for a month to sing for an event, uh, I have my wife and girls with me in the bus, and we are making a life and uh, a really big road life, really, out of it. Uh, it is written has been doing a lot of amazing things, even during the pandemic. Some of you are aware that we were trying to do an, uh, an evangelistic series in Indiana in Indianapolis just before the GC session. I was scheduled to sing for GC. I was scheduled to sing for this evangelistic series in Indianapolis. Um, and, you know, the pandemic, of course, hit right around that time. We had to pull the plug on, of course, GC and the evangelistic effort there in Indiana called Ignite Indiana. It's unfortunate. Literally millions of dollars were funneled into that effort. And uh, I remember talking on the phone with Pastor John. I was getting phone calls for three weeks canceling 160 concerts I had booked. And I remember I was talking to him on the phone. He says, I'm so sorry. We've got to pull the plug on this event. Um, what are your plans? And I said, I have no plans. I have no idea what I'm going to do. <laughs> he said, well, I can tell you this. Evangelism isn't canceled. I'll never forget him saying that. Evangelism isn't canceled. Yeah, of course. I said, so what are you going to do? He said, if I can't go... Preach it in an auditorium. I'm going to preach it in the studio. And so he wanted me to come down and record some music in the studio. He was going to preach his heart out every night for 28 nights there in Tennessee. And they were going to broadcast it on YouTube and Facebook Live. And I said, well, how are you going to advertise it? How are you going to get the audience? He says, we're going to use targeted ads. Now, those of you who know Facebook, you know that there are creepy features about Facebook. We like, and it is written, to use those creepy features to our advantage. <laughs> If you liked your brother's Bible verse that he posted three years ago on his wall and you hit like, Facebook remembers. And so when we send out a targeted ad, a sponsored ad, a boosted ad, advertising this upcoming live Hope Awakens evangelistic effort, right? Then we, we have all these metrics we can choose. Target this age group, maybe this gender, maybe this region. And in some cases, it's Target the people who show an interest in spiritual, spiritual things. Well, you're that person because you liked your brother's Bible verse three years ago and Facebook remembered. So these targeted ads were very, uh, very I don't know how to say it, but, but uh, almost acute in their ability to find people who we thought would be interested in the Hope Awakens evangelistic series all across the United States. As a result, when people uh, went ahead and tuned in to the Facebook Live feed of the evangelistic series, right? Facebook kept track of that. So-and-so clicked on it, watched it for 20 minutes. And so we were able to send messages to local pastors in those areas saying, hey, you got a guy that's interacting with us. 
in your area, can you just send them a private message and say, hey, I'm, uh, I'm one of the hosts for this online event. If you have any questions, I'm here in the area. Just let me know. And so pastors were connecting through this creepy Facebook thing. And we're keeping track of it. We're keeping track. Right now, as of today, I know that we have baptized over 3,600 people as a result of that Hope Awakens Evangelistic Series. I say this, I say this because I know the past few years have been upending our lives. I mean, they have. They have mine. And I know it's been tragic for people. And in the same sentence, I'm going to say that God is so good at bringing beauty out of the ashes. And Hope Awakens is just one thing he's done that has brought beauty out of the ashes. So this is your It Is Written. This is your NAD ministry. Pray for them. Support them whenever you can. I'm going to share with you a little video that I asked them to give to me because I can't possibly tell you everything that It Is Written is doing right now. There's a ton of stuff happening behind. It's more than just a guy with a New Zealand accent talking on TV, by the way, just so you know. Uh, There's a lot going on behind the scenes. I'm going to share this video with you. I think you'll be blessed by seeing what It Is Written has been doing all during the pandemic. For over 60 years, It Is Written's mission has been to reach as many people as possible with the gospel of Jesus Christ. From TV and radio programming in English, Spanish, and American Sign Language to resources such as our Bible study guides, It Is Written continues to redefine modern evangelism. We've expanded our evangelistic resources to make it easier for you than ever before to share the gospel with others. We've also launched multiple humanitarian projects that have opened hearts to the gospel like never before. It is written, Eyes for India gives sight to the blind and Mission Mongolia provides free medical care to thousands of Mongolians. People who would never have been interested in the gospel are picking up a Bible in their own language and learning about God's incredible love for the very first time. Our humanitarian projects, our television and internet programming, and our evangelistic resources are all designed around one common goal, to see people make lasting decisions for Jesus. We see those decisions being made every year as we conduct evangelistic series all over the United States and in countries such as Zimbabwe, Italy, Australia, Moldova, Peru, Colombia, and Cuba. Join us and get involved today. A lot of great stuff happening behind the scenes. We're about to go on a fall national tour. It'll be a 13,000-mile tour over the next few months. And uh, pray that people's lives will be drawn closer to the foot of the cross as a result of those efforts. There's my beautiful family, my wife, Heather. And uh, my oldest daughter, she's the blonde there, Emma. She's six. And there's Aubrey. She's my baby, and she is four, going on 20. (laughs) It's fun being a dad. It really is. It's quite a gift and quite a blessing. I want to have an opening prayer with you and then read our scripture again. Father, it's good to be in your house. It's good to be in your presence. We love Sabbath. Thank you for setting it aside for us. Thank you. Please bless our time together. And please let it be memorable, and please, Father, let it bring us closer to you. Just one step closer today, we pray in your name. Amen. Scripture reading this morning was already read, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16. And do not forget to do good and to share with others for, with such sacrifices God is pleased. I'm going to back up to the beginning of Hebrews chapter 13, verses 16. Two and three, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. By doing so, some have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. The whole basis of this morning's message that is on my heart is based on that concept of putting ourselves in other people's shoes. The title, of course, is Are You a Missionary or Are You a Member? Now, when it comes to memberships, I'm the king of that. You know, Netflix, Amazon Prime, Sam's Club. If there's a membership, I have it. I have a membership to the car wash in St. Joe. I can do unlimited car washes in a month, and I do. Sometimes I go twice a day. Got my car a little dusty in the driveway. 
I love memberships. I have a thing for them. You know, Sam's Club, I'm not sure why I have a Sam's Club membership. We live in a bus most of our lives. Where am I going to put a 36-roll pack of paper towel? There's no room. But I like Sam's Club. You know, when I'm there, I get treated special. I do. Uh, I mean, you think about it. You walk around, and uh, if, if you happen to buy something and you're not satisfied with it, they have an amazing return policy. Really, they take care of you. I, mean, I think I'm a Plus member. So uh, I know Heather and I bought a big suitcase from them, and we took it on one tour to Arizona. I had a concert one weekend. One weekend. And when we were on that tour, the uh, baggage attendants broke it. Surprise. And so we wanted to take it back to Sam's Club and return it, but it was outside the return window, right? What do they give you, 90 days? It was outside of that. And we said to them, listen, we've honestly only used the suitcase once. We bought it, it sat in the luggage bay of the bus, and then we went on this trip and it broke. Hey, oh, no problem, we'll take care of you. We'll return it, give you a new one. You want your refund? What do you want? We'll take care of you. Ah, oh, that's a great feeling. Some of you guys are Costco cult members, aren't you? I can tell. You guys are not excited about Sam's Club. You know what? Fair enough. There are more Sam's Clubs, though, out there than there are Costco, so I have to be okay with that. It's true. Uh, you know, not only that, when you're shopping, think about it. They give you food all along the way, so you can just sample this and that. It's nice. If I spill a 30-gallon jar of pickles in aisle seven, they'll clean it up for me, right? <laughs> it's, I kind of expect it now. I expect to be greeted at the door. Welcome to Sam's Club. I do. I expect people to help me when I have questions. Because I'm paying for this membership, I want to get something in return. Here's the thing that has been on my mind lately. And this is the Holy Spirit saying, Scott, I'm glad you love your memberships. I am. But don't take your membership mentality to church. And I started thinking about that, and I'm going, God, what do you mean by that? And it occurred to me that sometimes when I go to churches, I mean, sometimes I roll into church, I'm the singer, and, and you get treated really specially. Sometimes you don't. And God is reminding me, Scott, you're not at church to be served. You're not at church for what you can get. You're at church for what you can give. Stop acting like a member with a membership expecting something from church every week and start acting like a missionary who expects to give something every week. Oh, it changed my whole mindset about church. In fact, now when I talk to pastors and they say to me, how do you want the order of service to go today? We're going to give you the whole morning service to sing and do your program. I always tell them, how can I make it serve you the best? What's going to work for your church? What do you think your members are going to like? It's changed my mindset completely. Are we missionaries or are we members? You know, the missionary mentality really... Is, uh, it's a powerful concept. You know, I go to churches all the time, and, and they'll have this sign on the exit driveway of the church. So as you're leaving church and you're driving out, there's this sign. You are now entering the mission field. It's cool. Hey, that's a great reminder. But this is the thing with us, is that we, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we tend to compartmentalize missions. And so I always tell pastors of churches that have those signs, I say, hey, a little text message, Pastor Joe, love your sign. Thanks. Get another one. Put it at the entrance. Crickets. We compartmentalize missions. We think to ourselves, when I go to the Dominican Republic and I'm helping to put up a one-day church, I'm a missionary in the mission field. We show the slides on the screen of what the church mission project sponsored. The people who go with AFM, John Baxter's here. We have a lot of history at AFM together. The people who are missionaries with AFM and they're career missionaries, we have some really good friends of ours, the Sliger family in Papua New Guinea. We think they're missionaries. They're in the mission field. They're career, full-time missionaries. But I would challenge you that you are a career, full-time missionary. And so am I. We cannot compartmentalize missions. Your mission field is your circle of influence, and you are the missionary. It's an interesting study, etymology. I talked to uh, First Service about this a little bit. You know, we have these words that we use. 
uh, in the English language, and they've changed over the years. They mean something different today than they did when the words were first coined. I love this. Maybe it's the nerd in me, but I love etymology. This is a really fascinating study of words, their history, their meanings, and how it's changed over time. And I'll give you guys an example. So you guys know the word, um, n- the word naughty. I'll start with that one. The word naughty is well known to my six-year-old and my four-year-old. <laughs> if mom and dad said, hey, Emma, you've been naughty today, there's going to be consequences. You're going to take your bike away. You're going to whatever, right? Kids know all about this. We teach them, don't be naughty. Be Jesus to people. Have his spirit in you. The naughty spirit is Satan's spirit. Naughty is a negative connotation. Even in the secular world, Santa's wondering if you're naughty or nice, right? We know naughty is not a positive thing. It's a very, it means that you are uh, maybe a bad person or you're doing bad things. But years ago, when the word naughty was first coined, we find it in England many, many years ago, hundreds of years ago. It had nothing to do with being bad, only meant that you were poor. That's all it meant. So the etymology of that word has changed. You know, if you were in England walking down one of their brick streets and you had a cool British accent and you saw a man sitting on the curb and he was poor and he was begging for money, you'd say, this poor man, he's naughty. He has not. He has nothing. It just simply meant you were poor. But the etymology of that word has changed and now we know that naughty is something completely different. Uh, Another word phrase that has changed. There's, there's literally thousands of these, but another one I like is heartburn. You know, if I tell you at potluck that I have heartburn, you know, the ladies are going to dig in their purse for a Tums. Toss one my way. I'll help you out, Scott. Stop eating pizza. But you know, the, the, that, that term, heartburn, several hundred years ago, you know, what it meant was that you were lovesick. That's what it meant. In fact, if it was 300 years ago and I said I have heartburn, the ladies would crowd around me and say, who's the girl? (laughs) Tell us the story. Because really, so if I was love jealous, if I was, you know, when I was dating my wife, Heather, and and, and we're taking a nice romantic walk on the beach, and some guy's out there and he notices how beautiful my wife is and he's trying to get her attention. You know, guys, we do stupid things to get the attention of the girl we like. And he's... I'm going to get annoyed. I'm going to say, man, he's, you're late. You're too late. She's clearly with me. I'm getting kind of jealous, upset, right? I'm getting heartburn. <laughs> but over time, the etymology, is, etymology of that has changed, and so now it just, it's so boring. It just seems to mean that you have gastroesophageal reflux disease. <laughs> so we have the power in society to change the meaning of words, right? We do. We do. So when we take the word missionary... I think what we need to do, and it can start in the church, is we change the meaning of the word missionary. We change the etymology of that word when we do it in this generation. Here's why I'm saying that. You know, my, my family, when, when uh, I was relatively young when they joined the Adventist movement, and tonight, this is a great plug for my concert tonight, I'm going to share how my mother and father came into the church. I'm going to share that story. Some of you know it. It's probably most of you don't. My mom is a former Muslim. My whole family on my mom's side of the family are from India. And my dad was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. He's a uh, German-American, blonde hair, blue eyes. You mix the two, you get peanut butter. <laughs> but she, th- their story of how they came into the church is powerful. It really is. I'm going to share that tonight as part of my concert program. I'm going I'm to sing a lot more because that's what I'd rather do than speak. But I do want to share that. And uh, as, a result, so as a result of some miracles happening in my parents' lives that led them into the Seventh-day Adventist church movement, I was able to grow up in the church most of my life. My parents did what good Christian Adventist parents do. They bought me books to read, and they bought me good books. They bought me books about missions. I have a ton of them. I still have them. And I would read these books growing up about missionaries doing mission work. The problem is, and I'm only realizing this now, is that every one of those books referred to mission work that was somewhere far away in countries I couldn't even pronounce without fail. In fact, she never bought me a book about mission work in New York or Detroit, or Chicago. It was always in Africa, or India, or South America. And so, as a Christian, as an Adventist Christian young man, I was conditioned to believe that to be a missionary, I had to enter the compartment of going somewhere and being a missionary. Instead of being taught, like I'm trying to teach my girls, how oh, you're a missionary right now, right here. Dad, in the library, really? I'm not even allowed to talk in here. You're a missionary. How you relate to your sister, how you treat me, 
in front of all these people is going to preach a sermon to them, whether you realize it or not. You're a missionary. The library today, honey, is your mission field. This is how we change the etymology of the word missionary to mean something more relevant to our young people today. You're missionaries, and your mission field is wherever you are. I have a couple of great stories I want to share of how that works in real life. Um, this family right here, oh, this, oh, I never talked about this graphic this morning, and I meant to. I'll get back to it. I'll probably forget. But I want to talk about that. It's an interesting graphic. It shows the accessions and the losses in our church in terms of membership. And uh, I, it's, it's very fascinating. But I want to talk about this family. So these guys, we call them our bird friends. That's Anthony and Lindsay Madrigal with their little kids, Pendleton and Sorrell. During the pandemic, we, uh, some of you who follow us on Facebook, you know that in January of 2020, we were driving from Phoenix to Orlando. We had just wrapped up an evangelistic series with It Is Written at the Phoenix Convention Center, baptized almost 300 people as a result of that. It was awesome. We were on cloud nine as we left Phoenix and went to Florida for our winter tour. On the way, in a little town in Louisiana, the bus engine blew up. The town that it blew up in in Louisiana was called Scott, Louisiana. That's God's sense of humor, keeping things light. I mean, when the police department showed up to try to, you know, escort us off the highway, it said Scott Police Department. The tow truck said Scott's Towing Services. They personalized everything for me. <laughs> so anyway, some of you followed the progress as Heather and I put a new engine in the bus. That was a whole other story. It's a whole other sermon. It took us a few months to do, but we did ourselves swap engines in that bus. And then we drove up from Florida all the way up to Pennsylvania for my next evangelistic series I was singing for. I love singing for evangelistic series. I'll talk more about that tonight. But um, we, we get to Pennsylvania. We start the series. We're two weeks into it. We're parked outside the Hanover Seventh-day Adventist Church there in Hanover, Pennsylvania. And then the, it's like March of 2020, and everything just comes crashing down. Boom. Conference calls us. You got to cut the series. People are getting sick. You got to close the church down. It was tragic. The pastor didn't want to do it. He's like, we've got people coming that are hungry for the truth. You got to shut it down. And we did. So here we are in our bus parked outside this church in Hanover, Pennsylvania. 160 concerts canceled in three weeks. I'm not going to lie. I took our breath away. You know what? We are used to having faith building experiences when you live on the road in full time ministry. You do. But that one took our breath away. So the church actually approached us. They gave us keys to the church. They said, hey, listen, we know you guys are stranded. So here's keys to the church. It's your new 15,000 square foot home while it's shut down. Feel free to use it. <laughs> Thank you. So every Sabbath, we would get the girls in their Sabbath dresses and we'd get in our nice clothes and we'd take them into the church down the hall to their Sabbath school class. And I would lead them in song service and my wife would lead them in their lesson. And we had Sabbath school and we had church. We were the only ones there, but we did it. And so my kids will hardly remember the pandemic. <laughs> Life seemed kind of normal to them. So here we are, parked at this church. I ended up getting a job in construction, so I, I spent the rest of that year working in construction, uh, helping a church member build a large diesel truck repair shop. And uh, during the weekends on Sabbath, all the churches in the area were closed. And it was, uh, it was tragic for us. We wanted to be at church. But what we'd do is we'd just walk around the church. You know, we'd have our own service, and then we'd walk around the church grounds. And we were taking a family walk in August. It was August 1st. And we're walking across the church parking lot, and there's an intersection there, a street, a road. And we see a car pull up and pull over on the side of the road right next to the parking lot of the church. This young guy gets out. He goes to the ground. He picks up this little bird, and he hands it to me. And it was dead. I mean, it looked dead to me. And I said, what's this? <laughs> and he said, so this car in front of us just hit this bird, and my kids are in the back seat, and my wife's with me, and they're kind of upset about the bird getting hit, and so they just wanted to make sure I stopped to check on it. So could you just take care of this bird? It'll make them happy. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so I smiled, he left, and I set the bird in the grass because I'm not carrying around a dead bird. So three or four minutes later, he had done a U-turn down the road and turned around, came back, drove down the side road into the church parking lot and parked. And he gets out, and his wife gets out, and his kids get out. 
And we looked at them and we're like, they look our age. And the kids look like they're our kids' age. This is cool. I mean, by then, guys, we were really hungry for social people. I mean, we were. We, were, we probably had this wide-eyed look. It was a little scary because we hadn't seen people. And so they're there, and we're looking at them. He's like, hey, sorry to bug you. When I left, my kids were just really upset. Dad, you didn't make sure the bird was okay. Was it okay? He's like, I have no idea. I'm sure that guy, he looked like a nice guy. He'll take care of the bird. The bird was still in the grass. So I told them the bird is in the grass. All the kids are like, you know, on looking at this bird. So we start talking. We're standing there in the parking lot, the four of us. Hey, my name's Scott. Hey, my name's Anthony. My name's Heather. My name's Lindsay. Hi, nice to meet you. Why are you guys walking around in a church parking lot? And I was like, why not? What else is there to do? And then we explained to them what we were doing, that we lived in the bus, and they had seen the bus parked outside the church because it had been there for months. And uh, they said, wow, it's so cra- crazy you're saying this because we, uh, we've, we've been going to a church, a, a Sunday church, and we just felt called out of it. And we've just been looking. We're looking for a church. We're looking for, for just a new something different, just something more sacred and more beautiful and more real. And so we started talking about church, and we started talking about the Sabbath, and, and the kids before long lost interest in the bird, and we're doing somersaults into the ditch together because kids become friends instantly. About 20 minutes into our conversation, as true as I'm standing in front of you here today, that bird got up and flew away. And I'm, I'm wondering what the conversation God was having with the bird before, like, you're going to take one for the team. It's going to hurt. It's worth it. You got to wonder. So there are bird friends forever. There are bird friends. People ask us all the time, how's your bird friends doing? I'm like, they're good. You mean Anthony and Lindsay? Yeah, you're bird friends. I don't care what their name is. They're bird friends. That was at 5 p.m. in the evening when that bird was hit and he showed up. At 9.30 at night, we took this picture. After having talked and prayed and cried with complete strangers, God ordained us to intersect over a bird getting hit on the side of the road that day. We have been friends ever since. In fact, they came and visited us in Michigan. We've never been to Michigan, they said. Show us the best part of Michigan. We took them to the UP. <laughs> we actually didn't. Well, we did. We, we, so what we did is we, we took them in the bus, and we took them around the entire state of Michigan. It was a 10-day tour around the entire lower peninsula, around the entire upper peninsula. We hiked up there, took them to the lake. It was amazing. They loved it. They fell in love with it. They're coming back. We're trying to convince them to move here. They just might. But we have stayed in touch with them ever since. We have studied the Bible with them. We have uh, helped their hearts to become convicted about the Sabbath. That was a cool conversation, I'll tell you some other time. God is working on their hearts and bringing us all together, and they're lifting us up too, and we're having a bad day. Man, we get text messages from them. Man, we know you guys blew a tire on your bus and you're on the side of the road. We're on our knees right now as a family praying for you. These are the kind of people, this is the salt of the earth right here, and God brought us together in the church parking lot over a bird getting hit. They decided that their mission field was us in a church parking lot. And there we are, besties now. This is Camp Osaba. We took them to the camp. Yeah, you got to take them to the best that we have here in Michigan. So that's the boardwalk at Camp Osaba. They fell in love with camp. And this is, of course, down in St. Joe by the splash pad, all the kids hanging out. We're going to go see them again in September in Pennsylvania. Best of Friends. This is the kind of stuff that God does. This is in Portland. One of the things we try to continually press in the minds of the girls, I said it earlier, wherever you are, you are preaching a sermon. Whatever you're doing, whether you, if you're having a tantrum, you're preaching a bad sermon. And so be aware of who you were and what, how you're acting. And so we in Portland, I was singing for John's Evangelistic Series. We were there for an entire month. Actually, two and a half months we were in Portland. Our bus was parked there. I'm gone from 3 o'clock in the afternoon until 11 o'clock at night because by the time I have to get through traffic and get to the auditorium, set up, they do the camera stuff, the makeup, whatever, I'm, not, I'm literally not home until 11 o'clock at night. So I say goodbye to the girls at 3, I don't see them again until the next day. And that's how it is almost daily for the entire month. So in the mornings, I'm deliberate about us spending time together. And so Heather and I will jog, and the girls will ride their bikes. They have a little walkie-talkie. You can probably see it there on the bike. They ride ahead of us, and when they get a little too far ahead, we just radio them, slow down, wait, stop, wait for us. Well, this particular day, they're riding their bikes. There's this elderly couple just sitting there chatting with them. And I walk up, and they said, hey, you must be Scott. I'm Scott. Yeah, your daughter told us. You're the singer. (laughs) I'm the singer. (laughs) Yeah, your daughter told us. Like, what else did she tell you? 
So we started talking to these guys, Hans and Doreen, really nice. Hans is German, he's got this thick, awesome German accent. Doreen is just a sweet, sweet lady. They live in the area. And she said, so what kind of music do you sing? I said, oh, it's gospel music. And she's like, oh, we're not religious. <laughs> I said, oh, what kind of music do you like? And then she did, started talking to me about it. And we, this conversation ended up being 40 something minutes long. And by the end of the conversation, they said, hey, could you guys just come over to our house for dinner one night? Sure. So we chose a night that I wasn't singing. And she had texted me and she said, hey, do you guys have any like dietary restrictions? That's a loaded question when you ask an Adventist. So I tried to make it as simple as possible for her. And so she served us cheese pizza. <laughs> it was good. And so we showed up. She has the pizza ready. We sit around the table. And I said to her, I know you're not religious, Doreen and Hans, but would you guys mind if I prayed for you? I'm going to pray for the food, too, because we always say grace. The kids like to. But I'd like to pray for you. I mean, if it's okay. I'm in your home. I want to respect you. Yeah, go ahead. Pray for us. And I got to pray with these not religious people who lived in Portland. That was cool. That was like, check it off the bucket list. <laughs> we became fast friends that night, hung out with them for hours. They got to show us their whole property. They live right on the river. It's beautiful. There's their house right there on the river. He's got an electric car and his solar panels charged it. It's so cool. It's Portland. It's a totally different mentality there. It's cool. So we have been friends ever since. When Doreen goes on trips, she'll text me, I'm going overseas to go on this trip. That's what she does in her spare time. She goes all over the world. And I'll say, I'm praying for your protection. I'm praying for your safety. I'll keep you in prayer. Thank you. <laughs> the non-religious lady has some Indian dude in Michigan praying for her every time she goes on a trip overseas. This is what it is to be a missionary and have a missionary mentality versus a membership mentality. There's all of us together. Our last day in Portland, we wanted to take a picture before we left and say goodbye to Hans and Doreen. And there's my dad. Tonight, I'm going to talk about him. I'm going to talk about the book that he's holding in his hand, those books, because those books were the start of my parents' relationship with Jesus because of someone's missionary mentality. It's a powerful story. I want to share this as I kind of wrap this up to a close because this is where the missionary versus membership mentality has become very real in our lives. In 1986, I was at daycare, and the daycare person who run, ran, runs the daycare, whoever she was, ran it, called my dad, and she said, Scott's sick. We need you to come pick him up. He's like, what do you mean sick? Is he sneezing? No, he's throwing up. Uh oh. So my dad gets off of work goes to the daycare center, picks me up, takes me home. They expected I would be okay. I was four years old. He said, we'll keep you home for a couple days, give you stuff real easy, crackers, toast, until you get over whatever it is you have. Two days later, I was still sick. Three days later, I was still sick. Four days later, I was still sick. Got to the point, five days later, I just wasn't even eating. They couldn't convince me to eat anything or drink anything. I was getting real lethargic. They took me to our family pediatrician, primary care physician, and he took one look at me and he said, you need to take him to the emergency room and just go straight there from here. So my parents took me to the emergency room. At the emergency room, they decided to transfer me to Phoenix Children's Hospital because they figured my condition was a little bit serious. And so I was at Phoenix Children's Hospital for a few days while they did some tests, thinking I just had a stomach bug, thinking maybe I had a parasite from drinking yucky water, something, normal kid stuff. Nothing came back positive. None of the antibiotics or antiparasitic drugs did anything. I ended up having my condition downgraded to the point I was admitted to the pediatric intensive care unit there at Phoenix Children's. And within a few days, was put inside an oxygen tent. Now. This is a period of time when my parents have just become Seventh-day Adventist Christians. And this is what Satan does. People whose faith is fresh and new, he likes to say, you know what, this is a good time to take them down. You know when a plant is just growing, my girls, 
found a tiny, teeny weeny maple tree growing in the yard, and they decided they wanted to plant it, so they got a pot out and some soil and stuck it in there. It was thriving. And then one day, one day, they forgot to water it, and it's gonzo. It's dead. Leaves fell off. It's done. I can't get it to come back. Satan knows that when you're just starting out in your faith, it's when you're the most vulnerable. Because it's going to go one way or the other. You know, we talk about people all the time. Oh, man, that guy, he just joined the church. He's got tons of faith. I mean, he is trusting in God. I, I beg to differ. You don't have a lot of faith when you first find Jesus. You don't. You just don't. Faith is something you exercise and you grow. It's like me saying, hey, tomorrow I'm going to go bench press 250 pounds. There's no way. If I worked up to it for a couple years, I might get there, maybe. But faith and enthusiasm, we get them confused because it's easy to have enthusiasm. When you first find Jesus and you realize he's died for you and he's coming back for you, you're excited. You're enthusiastic. You want to tell people, of course. But your faith, it's still not strong yet. And that was my parents. Man, enthusiastic. But the faith, still working on it. And so here's an opportunity right now They're praying, God, please heal our kid. And a week later, I'm in the ICU. And their faith is being challenged. My dad said, you know what? There was a point in time we actually, I know this sounds crazy, but you got to understand we were so new to this. We were thinking, man, we joined this church and our son is dying. This is weird, bad karma. (laughs) That's what they said. It's what you say. You're trying to explain away why something so tragic is happening to you after you've given your life to God. You go, this doesn't, this doesn't seem to add up, God. I, I kind of assumed that if I gave my life to you, life would get a little easier. That's another mistake. Life does not get easier when you give your life to God. By the way, anybody here who's about to make that decision or who has, you know what I'm talking about. Life gets better. For sure it gets better. It doesn't get easier. It doesn't. Not in this world. Someday it will, yeah. So here my family was struggling with their faith. And the one thing my dad says, the one thing we thought of, it actually got to the point, I'm skipping this part, I'm missing this part. The, the one night, he, he said the physician came in around nine o'clock at night to the waiting room because visiting hours were ending and they were going to send my parents home while they kept me overnight again. And he said, listen, all of the tests we've done for every possible thing that could be causing his condition have come out negative. The only thing we can do is we have this broad label for this, and it's called latent failure to thrive. And we, don't, we, we literally have done everything we can do. We're feeding him through a tube. He's continuing to waste away. He's, he's literally, he's dying. He used those words. My dad said he actually told us you were dying. And so we're sitting in the waiting room after he leaves, and it's 9 o'clock at night, and we were just, we couldn't, it took our breath away. We were stunned. He said, we had the presence of mind. We had the pastor's phone number on the church bulletin that we had been attending, Phoenix Central Church. Just started attending it. And so we saw that number. We called it. The pastor answered his phone at 9.30 at night. He said, and we said, listen, you guys probably don't know us, pastor. We're just new members of your church. We come in. We have two kids. And, oh, yeah, I remember you guys. Sure, I've seen you. Yeah. How can I help you? What's going on? So they explained the situation. They said, listen, our, our, we just got told by this physician that our son is dying and we're not sure what to do. And he said, don't do anything. His missionary mentality kicked in right then. Don't do anything. Stay where you are. I'm coming to you right now. And at 930 at night, the pastor got dressed, got in his car, and drove to Phoenix Children's Hospital Pediatric Intensive Care Unit to be with my family. Before he did that, he got on the phone with his prayer warriors. You guys know who you are. I know the Village Church has them. You guys have had a prayer warrior group since two remodels ago. I remember. I'm thankful for you, prayer warriors. You've got an awesome mission. He called his prayer warrior team. He said, listen, guys, start this prayer chain. This is before cell phones. You had to do it, you know, landline style. Can you guys start a prayer chain for this family? You may not remember them. Some of the people knew who we were. Most of them didn't. We need to pray for them. Their son, Scott, he's in the hospital. He's dying. I don't know the details. I'm headed there right now. I'll just start a prayer chain. We found out later, we didn't know at the time, but we found out later there were six or seven people that were part of that prayer group that actually drove to the church that night, formed a circle in the sanctuary, and began to pray for me. God, we're in your house. You have to hear us. Pastor shows up. 
He's having his first pastoral visit with these new church members. That's a tragic way to do it. And he's sitting there and he's trying to hug my family through this situation. He's trying to somehow cradle their faith, having no idea what was going to happen in the next few days. Well, here's what happened. At midnight, there's a nurse shift change. The night nurse comes in. She has been taking care of me for a couple weeks. She has talked to the previous nurses and the physicians on call. She knows I'm dying. And one of the things she told my parents, she says, it was bothering me that you were in this oxygen tent 24 hours a day, and literally, other than changing a diaper or changing a pick line or whatever they called it, we, we just, you never got touched, you never got held. And I thought to myself, if this kid's gonna die, I'm gonna hold him before he dies. Praise the Lord for nurses. I have a special place in my heart for you. So she said, I did something that was probably not okay with protocol, but we were a little bit more relaxed back then about stuff. She says, I got your son out of the oxygen tent. And I had these lines attached to me, so she had to wheel, while she's carrying me, a wheel around a little cart with the drip lines attached. She had a banana in one hand, just trying to get her little snack in before her shift. She said, I was walking around with Scott in my arms, and he all of a sudden reached for a banana. And I thought that was strange because I'd never seen him so interested in food the entire time he was here at the hospital, not once. And they tried. They tried to offer me everything you can imagine just to see if I could eat. So she thought that was strange. So she <clears throat> broke off a piece of that banana and she gave it to me and I ate it. And she waited for me to vomit it up. I'm starting to be gross, but this is real life. But I, I didn't. She thought this is wild. So she broke off another small piece and she gave it to me. And she kept doing that. And she said it took about an hour to feed him one banana because I did it really slow. But he ate that entire, I didn't get a bite. He ate that entire banana. So she immediately calls the physician on call that night. And she said, listen, this is what's happening with Scott. What do you want me to do? And he jokingly said, go buy more bananas. <laughs> that was the running joke. I was upgraded out of the ICU in the next two days to a normal floor. Within another seven days beyond that, I was released from the hospital on a special diet. And I love bananas to this day. <laughs> God provided an amazing miracle on my behalf. He could see the end from the beginning. He knew I'd be standing in front of you here today. But the focus I want to focus on for just a minute as I close this morning is how a church family who really didn't even know us circled the wagons around us because their mission field that night wasn't in India. It was in a pediatric intensive care unit at Phoenix Children's Hospital. That was their mission field. Their mission, pray this family through this tragedy that they may have to endure. The pastor, his mission, Love this family through this tragedy they may have to endure because that's what families do. That's what missionaries do. And so I want to encourage us to circle the wagons around each other. Village Church has always been a family. It's one of the reasons we loved this church. It's one of the reasons I attended here and I, I was a member here and I was a member of the choir and I, I did my first concert here because you guys were a family to me. You were a family to my family. My mom has been through all kinds of stuff during her time here at Village, and people were hugging her through it. Find a way to be a missionary to each other, because if we create that missionary dynamic in church, when people around us are seeing the dynamic, they're going to want to be a part of this. And I'll tell you something, you don't ever want to leave a church that truly feels like family. So are we missionaries or are we members? I sure hope we're missionaries first because that's what God calls us to be. We're going to close with our closing song and then I'm going to have a benediction to bless you as you go home.